Hey everybody, thanks for coming out to Malvern Books. Welcome. Uh, we have an exciting reading for you today to poets, Steve Wilson and C. Prudence Arsido. And they are uh, going to take turns reading poems instead of you know one coming up and reading and then the other. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them both to you. Steve Wilson's poems have appeared in journals and anthologies nationwide. He's the author of four collections of poetry and editor of The Anatomy of Water, a sampling of contemporary American prose poetry. He teaches in the MFA program at Texas State University. C. Prudence Arsenault, a native Texan, is a poet who has taught English and creative writing at Austin Community College since 1998. Her work has appeared in various journals, including Limestone, New Texas, Clark Street Review, and Inkwell. Her chapbook, Dirt, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2017. Please welcome Steve Wilson and C. Prudence Arsenault. We're still trying to figure out how this is gonna work. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear us okay? Am I good? Um, and we were just talking, should we stand up, sit down? Well, I don't know. I feel like um, it would be part of the dance thing where we're... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, before we start, I, I, I just want to say something about Prudence. Um, I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be later. Um, it's really exciting to me to be able to read with her, and I'm, I'm really proud of her for having this book come out. Um, she was one of my first MFA students back in the 1890s. <laughs> oh, 1990s. Some of them are still going, oh my God. Yeah, so we've known each other a long time and um, I, I've followed her career teaching at ACC since she graduated and we've kept in touch. So this is, this is really great for me and when I decided I'd give a reading here when my book came out, I immediately thought it'd be fun to do it with Prudence. Um, the reason I thought it would be fun to alternate is because I also think it will be fun for us to kind of exchange these, these poems. I've, I've read her book. I, I, I assume she's looked at my cover. Yeah. Um, but I love blue. Yeah, love that's, that's good. That's good. Um, so, you know, I, I hope it's fun. I, I'm, I'm going to enjoy reading with her. I don't have any dance moves. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. You want to go first? Oh, I think you just decided I would. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, this chapbook, Dirt, is an homage to my family. Um, more specifically, it's an homage to my father. Um, we lost him 10, 11 years ago, and I know that my dad has always been a part of my poetry, but it wasn't until he was gone that I found how deeply he connected to every part of my world and how closely he lived in the words that I write. Um, so I'm going to read can you get a little closer to the mic? I'm going to read Thank you. the good job of the mic, Steve. Uh, the title poem for this book, Dirt. Um, I should let you know, my dad was uh, an avid gardener. Uh, he came from a family of farmers, but he pretended that he was not a farmer. Uh, but he took up most of our backyard with a garden, and then he tried to get us to be gardeners as well, and failed miserably. Dirt. I am not a gardener, grubber of plants, shifter of soil. My nails clean. I stop kneeling years before I reach this age. If you ask, I can tell a food seed from a pretty one. Clarify that tomato is fruit. Tell you, when the red hibiscus sits crushed in your hand, it smells of blood. The hammerhead worm tosses its head wetly when cut with a spade. A crooked row means death for someone. Shit produces the best foundation. A tree can live around the rod at its base, but dies in the beauty of mistletoe. Poison grass returns as weeds, mutates to flowers. Blue morning glories will cover your garden. Beautiful, but chokes your roses. All this I learned on my knees from my father, my teacher. Beer in one hand, the other browner and dirt. That the dog will follow and proof your work. 
that here, the frost will come back and kill your grapes, no matter what. That squirrel stockpile, even when there is no need. <clears throat> The other benefit to alternating is there's more clapping. <laughs> oh, sometimes. <clears throat> um, I will read uh, this next poem. With the holidays coming up, I've been thinking about um, spending time with family, and Thanksgiving as a holiday uh, was the one that I spent the most time with my dad. Uh, we all gather at one person's house as Thanksgiving works. Um, but my dad was never very happy about being in a large group, and I picked that up from him, and so often he and I would just spend time together. Not necessarily talking, just together. Um, I miss him more on those days, and I think about this idea of visiting with him, which is now more difficult. Uh, this poem is entitled, Where He Lies. I hear my father's tombstone is edged marble, white like a monogram shirt. I wouldn't know. There was no stone when we walked away from that earth, wet at its edge, heat dancing drunk from the hole. The Rim Army had packed their tape recorder. The grave diggers, distant cousins, spit in the grass, made plans to make happy with cousins, not us. The bastard priest shot for a ride back to the church hall, a horror done with work, looking for food. I haven't returned. My uncle tends the grave. He mows the grass around his father's grave, his sister's grave, his brother's grave, his mother's grave, his sister's grave, his nephew's grave, his brother's grave, his nephew's grave. He is in death's employ. In our family, he will never be without a job. I'm glad he does it. In overalls, brogans, baseball cap, hidden in the pines and cypress, the hum of a mower, harmonies, mosquitoes, and frogs. He reports to my mother. My sister and I pay him in silence. I'm glad he does it. If death fired him and hired me, I'd cover it all with pitch and burn us right out of the ground. So a little bit about um, this new collection of mine, which you can find in the table bank. Um, I, I was really nervous when I sent it out and then got more nervous when it was accepted because it's, it's very different from, me, from what I've done before. Um, I went through a little bit of a crisis poetically four or five years ago, um, decided that the way I worked, which was kind of obsessive and overly meticulous, um, kind of had run its course. And so I thought I needed to try something different. And so kind of really on a whim, I uh, sent out a post to all of my friends on Facebook saying that for the next year, I was going to post a poem a day that I would write that morning before I posted it. Um, and I told them to make me stick to my promise. Which uh, we did. Which they did. Yeah. Um, and because, you know, normally before that, I was very careful revising, revising, revising my work. This was a completely foreign way of writing poetry for me. Um, and I, I did it for a year, and what I ended up with at the end was uh, a pretty considerable pile of crap. Um, but a, a lot of other pieces that seem to cohere into maybe a bigger poem because they shared a theme or they shared a certain mood. And so I went back and started looking at those, revised them a bit. Uh, and what that did for me is it, it loosened up my, the way I wrote poetry. So this, this book, completely written after I went through this experiment, some of the poems in here are from that experiment, and I was terrified it was a complete failure because it wasn't how I wrote poetry. Um, so it really surprised me a couple of weeks ago, I think, when um, Prudence told me that this, is, this sounds like me to her, because this does not sound like me to me. Um, so I'm either schizophrenic or I can't hear myself very well. But I, I'm still trying to work through her comment. I don't, I don't see it yet. It's so foreign to me. But I thought uh, the first two poems I would read were, would be a couple that were gathered from that experiment. 
So um, on the page, each, each section is divided by a series of asterisks so that there's a break in the poem. And I, I, for the ones that I've done with this, I've put together five or six different ones that came from different times of the year when I wrote them. Um, so the first one obviously is organized around a very obvious idea, the title is Six Storms. There are six parts and six different storms. So let me read that one for you. Storms flower, the skies blackening to slate. Night jars dive into an echo. There were some asterisks there. Rain thunders in, all teeth and bone. Autumn storms conjure a second spring. Fall greens, blooms in spite of itself. Under lowering skies, summer growls and glowers, then goes. The eloquence of mist at storm's edge. Storms descended, evening all day. And then the other one is called Green Ruins. And this one is a series of, of small pieces that um, explore the, the first person, the identity, or the self of the speaker. Up late investigating versions, you or you as you. Find me wandering in the threadbare hours. So much of what is, is past, a confusion, back trail of tangled branches. Sight lines, I to they, no to be, drift to need. I see the world I cannot see, the shrouds faint intimations. First fruits, new leaves on the path, these few words. person, um, different skin, the land was foreign and I did not like it and I came running back to be comfortable. Um, and this poem reminded me of that time in New Mexico as we lived in drought, right? Uh, no rain from the sky, the earth cracking, and I thought I'd escape that when I came back to Texas and then I found that I was still living in it. Um, and I can't help but think about how we're all connected to the land. This one's called Human Geography. We are stretched across borders, parched. We gape for each other. What words we remember are lost in the static of the air. What we have forgotten is weather. I am cracked and weighted. We search for song, for water to rise and drown, but are worn down by my weight. We hope you recover your voice, but droughted, you don't even know clouds, though they hang above us. We can only point into their black bellies, like cavern tapping into the smooth black black above the blue. Mouths open. I know they hold no relief. <coughs> Yet somehow, yesterday we did remember wind. Devils and tumbles hugged us and spun us so. The black above and the wordless words within are only as important as the skin we hold softly to our bones.
closely connects to what Steve just read. And it's not in my book. I know you're like, that's a lot of pages. <laughs> a lot of pages. Uh, there we go. So there are some things I have to explain about this poem, some words. Uh, I've been telling my students lately that I love fancy words, and so sometimes I drop them in, and they don't fit anything else, but I love fancy words. Uh, so one of the words that's going to pop up in here, chronology, uh, telling the future from the bumps on your head. Uh, the other is cubit, ancient measurement, uh, uh, 13 to 19 inches or so. Um, and then phaneromania, uh, the human urge to pick at scabs and imperfections. <laughs> I love that there's a word for that. Like, it makes me happy. <clears throat> um, so, Steve, you read a poem that was talking about uh, the self and finding self. Uh, so, this one's entitled Discover. I have found that it never hurt to wander with my hands gripped tightly at the base of my skull, explore the chronology of the land under my toes. I began this practice to stop myself from picking the scab you so artfully shaped, hiding it beneath my stiff shoulder blade. Filling the pages of my diary with the cubits I used to measure time, I noticed my reference were wrong. I wonder if you know when God claps his hands in your ears, it is the falling of trees in Brazil but phone connections were lost long before this was material. I begin to imagine the faces of your children and that dark milk in the bottom of cocoa mugs and realize that digging in the dirt of garden variety couches for old pictures and names is easier than answering the phone on the fourth ring instead of the third. Patiently, I eat from tin foil forks and listen to my feelings tell me that ultimately it is simpler to gnaw on those forks then chew out the words necessary to find someone with the slim fingers of your left hand, the dull cleverness of your teeth. And still, this common phanaromania keeps me looking, because my imperfect angles allow a multitude of possibilities for stained shirts, but no chance of healing. I have to respond now. I'm just saying. You set, you set the bar up. I, right? Take it down or anything up here, but <laughs> New Mexico haiku. Uh, um, this is um, a poem describing a, a picture by Ansel Adams of Aspens in northern New Mexico. Aspens at nightfall, white fissures of light fade to shadow, thought hushed within distance. I could do something with some ancient imagery too. So um, this is the, the book that came out before the, the current one. And um, the poems in here are written either about or set in Ireland, the whole, the whole book. And this one is called The Stone Cross at Kilmalkadar Church. Um, this is a, a monastery site very far west of Ireland from probably 900 AD and there are the ruins of a church there. It's a really evocative space, especially if you get there on a day when it's gray and kind of misty and a little raining. Um, and so I think this one is something like what you're writing about. Darken my door, stern bird of the world, whose song and stone from injury are, whose form is thought that shadow defines. Speak from some moment now left in leaves. Say we are wandering that turn in the wood, still secrets there, its rough gods, long grown in the grain. Darken my door, stern bird of the world, whose song and stone from injury are. Once of a memory as the last light fell, down <coughs> from the trees, down from the sky we watched through the distance. Who's lived such longing? Darken my door, stern bird of the world, 
who saw him and stone him from injury are. Return on the cautions echoed in water. I would not curse this. I would not stumble, hollowed within and deepening. Flame with your murmur, your murmur of wings. Old home, all word of its worth. downstairs was walking someone out in the parking lot and they were a little loud, it's 11 p.m. Uh, but apparently my next door neighbor was really not happy about it, so stepped out onto the landing and yelled out in the parking lot, shut up nigger, and then walked back inside and played the door. I say this to think about, uh, before I moved into this apartment complex, I had a home because I tried to be good, as my dad said, get some land. Um, but I'm not good about taking care of the grass, and so I'm out there and I'm watering the grass, and my neighbor, lovely woman, great, asked me over for food, wine, came outside and asked me how things were going on the plantation. This poem is entitled, This is the Summer of Growing Grass. Farmer, my neighbor says, a chancing sport of luck and hope. As I stand in the sun, I feel how the heat settles into the dark circles under my eyes, the broken rows of my brow. This is the work of a nursemaid. You wake early, eat the air, sleeves rolled, and you can't help but sigh when you see the earth hasn't drunk enough. Can't think of what you could have done differently. The sun has only begun its job when you first wake to yours. You see, this is a business. The sun, the salesman of light and life, and you, the broker of guess and mistakes. Were I a vain woman, I would say I like the way the sun turns my hair, how it deepens the red in my skin. But I'm watching water, I'm counting days, and I'm working on my poor man's frown. It is everywhere in my family, um, and I suffer a kind of paranoia believing my turn is next. Um, oftentimes going home, it is a reminder of that from text messages, phone calls, messages on Facebook. Um, it's always been there, but it wasn't until this one particular aunt was diagnosed that I recognized what it was that was killing us. Um, and when I found out, I was working at Astro World. You guys familiar with that? Uh, Six Flags had a park in Houston, and I was working there. And I believed that I could compartmentalize and separate myself from all of those things, and yet I found that it stuck with me. Um, while I worked at Astroworld, I worked on the train. So they had a train that went around the park. And so this poem is uh, entitled Train Song, and it's set up in four parts, and each part starts with part of the train communication. Um, for those of you who don't know, the horns that keep you awake, that annoy you, uh, it's the trains talking back and forth to each other. And in the park, we had to learn the actual language of the trains. So each of these sections has part of that language in it. Uh, train song for Trish. Three short, backing up. The car is moving through fog, fog like old syrup. Listen to the distance in the dark. Says she's looking for the green reflection of eyes. Cats, deer, dogs. I want to reach over, take her hands from the wheel. I don't want to live this way. Fear of life, speed, of reflection, animals. Faster, I think. We must go as fast as it eats at her. 
one short. Ready. Red moon out. A sign that what is lost was lost for me and replaced. Natural progression to anger gives a safety time. When the heat cools below my eyes, past the line of sight of my nipples, as slanted as that line may be. Too short. Going. I chose to be in the middle of the tunnel, darkest here in the middle of the sentence, unsure of its ending, where it is the coolest. Sweat becomes a sheen, yet not smelling of the stagnant water resting between the tides. Train humming in the distance, not at the entrance, still like my body shaking. Hands fading to the ground of the wood. The bleached rocks, oil like blood in open veins, seeps through the fabric of my skin, presses up through my gnawing fingers. Too long, one short, one long. Thinking of Russia, endless nights, cold water. Hell is different for each of us. Before Brodsky died, he said the horns sound so human, so sad. And I stand beyond the road and count. Too long, one short, one long. I'm coming to a crossing and going on through. into the classroom when Bronski was talking to a class and uh, Prudence was helping me with visiting writers back then. He'd, he'd met her. He stopped his presentation and looked over at me and said, where is Prudence? <laughs> I want Prudence. <laughs> so as often as I can. I, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one of the effects of opening up my um, creative process the way I did was my poems quite often became more topical. I wrote about things that were going on in the world um, as kind of sources of information. And so Prudence mentioned she'd like me to read this poem. It's called Resistance, that one. So this one is about the uh, protests on uh, the Texas State campus the day after the presidential election. And uh, they did a story about it in the Texas Observer, and they published my poem at the end of the story. Resistance, San Marcos, November 2016. Let me tell you, I never thought I'd write a political poem about San Marcos. <laughs> but it's an interesting place these days. It's changed a lot. Within morning's unsettled light, students stride out into the streets, shocked by their hopefulness, the dark wine of their defiance. Comrades gathering to breach the bounds. Here's another one set in Texas. Another odd irony about Prudence and I is we both worked at Astro World. <laughs> Different times. So this one is called On Texas 2016. Hoping for something still open, for openness, we follow that long highway west Parched scrubs, double wides beside the bone dry creeks, the sprawling red mesas outside Ozona. At Sanderson, everything bolted down tight, closed faces. One more little short one. I'm going to read one more short one. I'm on a roll now. Uh, this one is about uh, Buffalo Bayou, Bayou when it flooded. So I'm still in Houston, if that's okay. <laughs> Buffalo Bayou, August 2017. The ground undone by flood floats an ocean of silences and glass downtown. Ghost roads navigate the dirt brown deepening waters. of moving to another place for four years. 
uh, this poem came out of the long drives that I made. So uh, Albuquerque to Houston um, with OK weather is about 24 hours, 21 at the time, right? So I guess now you can go 85, so it's a little bit faster. But um, it's interesting to watch the landscape change. Uh, but for me, it was about feeling my skin take in all the moisture again, like feeling like I was back at home. Uh, so I wrote this poem. It's entitled A Thousand Miles. I stood in the grass, head far back, wishing on stars, streetlights from a million broken highways that mangled my search, tore my map. I wasn't making good time anyway. The maroon sky slowly tugged me into sleep, and the conditioned air had begun to taste like the sweat that eased down my forehead. By the time I reached Clarendon, the music had run out of meaning, and no matter what the sign said, I don't recall when the scenery changed and left me here. This is the last time I'll hit Oakley Union, and I can't stop again until I get to Bowie. So I have to make the most of this rest stop midnight view of river, mountain, restroom stalls, the smell of dis disinfectant making me think of oranges. It's the same thing at every one of these stops since Albuquerque. The way I stare into the distance, hoping the sand will rise in a wave and wash me back where I might have belonged in a different time as a different person. Mm -hmm. But my friends tell me the cowboys are looking better every year in Houston. And it's about time I returned home, which has always been familiar, bordering on monotonous. I walk back to my car, and as I fold myself in, I try to remember why I know a song about a yellow rose in Texas and nothing about blue bonnets. that my mom thinks is for her. Uh, well, she says I don't write any poems about her, and I'll write all my poems about my dad. And uh, this has the word mama in it, so uh, she claims it, but I don't think she should, but I'll let her roll with it. Uh, it's entitled Agency. I almost didn't make it home last night. I sat at the new table, thinking what it could be that held me here. You would say gravity, but it must be something stronger. And I thought on that for a bit, finally getting up to work my legs to the equation, back and forth in a line that would never be straight. But the hitch in my left leg always interrupted the thoughts. Outside, I knew, was the kind of sky that could take me in, hold me, twirl me like a dancer. The color of what my little girl dreams once were but now the minty black holds a little less than half. If you ask this body, it's far too much. I still had to walk under the sky to get home, the color molding to my shoulders, the pressure bending any joint that wished to be bent. Mama, is it enough that my dreams come to me in white with an outline of gray? What I dreamt the night before doesn't matter, but I remember fading into the threads of my sheets seeking the smell of this one body in the fibers, scenting my body as only a stranger would, or a man. When the sky shifted to a light, I felt my body rise from the inside, only to fall over the right side. That's the side I sleep on, you understand, to keep my loving hand free. Mama, I don't know what happens at night. The sounds of misplaced vents and replaced pipes makes a hiss like you made when I was younger. Only this goes on and on. The voices of the children downstairs, that's how I know when to start breathing again. That's the part that doesn't make sense. The rising and falling under slatted light was easier than this. In the middle of the day between listening and hearing, I wonder if I really do it, or do I move my mouth, my nose, my chest to make it all go on? Mama, can I repeat what echoes in my head? I'm tired and this body's all wrong for me. This body rattles of old machines and hums like the sky after thunder. Where are my freckles? My smile of teeth hollow and clear like gems. 
Where's that place you told me would draw the sun in? A center, you called it, that would allow anything to drill right into me, leaving behind a trail like a trap in snow. I need to know because it's open, and the wind moves through it and leaves nothing behind. These feet couldn't make the journey I planned. Somewhere I could find huge spaces of water and keep on walking right in. I had a plan that if I could see the sky with a different angle of light, something else could take me in. But these feet, with these sharp ankles, and their brittle blade bones, could only bring me here, like pigeons or cats. They know all the turns and stretches, and they knew just where to stop in the kitchen by the stove. in the air itself. Even at stop signs, all motion and movement. In my dreams, a dark green that is like river, water. It goes, flows now out toward the hollows, and I go too. I follow, I agree, I do. In my dreams, you and I, out early in a gray boat, the lake Blossoms broad and silvering, light easing over the tree line. And the shore, the shore, there are miles yet to the shore. So your mother thinks that poem is about her. This is a poem that no one knows is about me. So it's called The Supernumeraries, and um, this is a very old poem, and it came out in an anthology a few months ago. I was just thrilled because I kept sending it out. I thought, I really like this one. Uh, maybe because it's about me, I don't know. <laughs> so um, in, in case you don't know, a supernumerary are the extras in an opera. Uh, and as Nancy, my wife, knows, I served as an extra in a couple of operas in Fort Worth. Very odd. <laughs> I can't sing it. <laughs> Off stage, they've seen it all before the final scene that calls them from their friendly game of cards. Someone will be murdered tonight. The Count, foreign-born, sings of a dream. A woman, alluring behind her green mask, offers wine to her secret lover. It is a persuasive shade of red. When he drinks, night jars scatter for the forest. It is an omen the Count cannot ignore. Who will, who will believe? Who will take from his hand jewels bound in a kerchief that would save the beautiful soprano? He thinks the watery curve of her whispers is a revelation. Curious how his life is mirrored in music. A light from somewhere in the wings upon the swells of violins. The morning he feared would arrive. That growing tide of chord upon chord Yes, someone will be murdered. There's a dagger in the folds of the diplomat's cloak. Done since act two, while voices swirl like leaves, the courier clowns in his Stetson, stage left, signaling beers all around. The coachman places his bet. <laughs> that um, are, are from my new collection and are in two voices. Um, I encourage my students to try to draw into their work whatever happens to be going on, not only um, in content at the time they live, but <coughs> method at the time they live. And so I, I thought I needed to take that advice as well. And um, I, I wrote several poems um, in the form of text messages, but as an exchange of text messages. They're, you know, texts tend to be fairly short. Um, there's a distance between the, the text you send and the answer you receive. And I wanted to try to capture that. And so on the page, if you look in the book, the one, one um, side of the conversation is up, upper left, other side is lower right. So you can read them separately if you want to. And I also included 
some sort of phrase like I texted before each transmission so that the reader's always reminded that this is not a person-to-person -person conversation. There's some distance that's maintained throughout the conversation. And, and it's fun to hear, the, hear them read in two voices. I think I've done it a few times, and Prunes and I did it on the radio a few months ago. It was, it was really fun, so I thought we'd, we'd finish with two of those. Okay? So the first one, we, we talked about this online, how we would do this, and Prudence suggested maybe she should be in a different part of the room. Just saying, so it sounds like the message is coming in. Yeah. Right, like, oh. Maybe the, the restroom, you could, you could shout from over there. Nice echo. Yeah. So this one's called uh, Cells. All the ones I wrote are, are cell, cell poems, obviously. Um, evening. I texted the deliciousness of endings. I texted, I'm down in the canyon now. And then I texted, work done, and sunlight. And then I texted, walking, walking. And then endings made me want to see you. And then within my own spaces, paths, shades. And I texted, I could have come with you if you had waited an hour, the two of us then, and the autumn elms. And I texted, alone. And myself for this little while, outside you. And I texted, a long way that path. I texted, borders I'm tending. I texted, levees, windscreens, walls of glass I walk into, shifts of scene. I texted, they grant me shards of myself, cracks for breath. I texted, comfort at the end of a long day. That's all. I texted. Exactly. 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 My own ways. Then, not much to ask. Then, for you. And this one is, did you make it home? I texted, did you make it home? I texted, the roads were terrible. And then I texted, nothing but snow all day. And then I texted, ice, ice and ice. And then, the lowering light, the harbor. And then, you and your coastlines. And I texted, sometimes, just, just watching the water is enough, the gulls and their insistences. And I texted, sound does it for me, waves. The bell far out beyond the lights. I texted, the door is still open. I texted, we've been over this. I texted, tree roots, your, dr your driveway noons. You thought about leaving before you left. I texted, whatever home was, I made it out of that empty space. I texted, who said time and tide? Who imagined? I texted, no poems. Not this time, okay? Not now. Then, so many days of snow. Then, ice.